idea. There are bad people out there. Come on, Lisa. It'll feel good. hand is gonna do terrible things first question for both of you mm. i want to tease your relationship in the movie a little bit so Catherine, can you tell me something that lisa sees in the creature that draws her to him and then cole the opposite for you something he sees in her sure. that sparks that love sure. well we first meet creature in a cemetery and he's not alive yet so i think the thing that attracts lisa to him is that he doesn't talk <laughs> She can just look at his pretty face and say whatever she needs, and she never feels judged. Now, isn't that sweet? It's so relatable, too. It's so, it's so relatable. relatable. We all fall in love with the picture, right? This is why people love dogs more yeah. than other human beings. I know. Yeah. They don't talk back. Yeah. So I, I think it. it's that. And then again, sometimes they do. Sometimes. Mine does. <laughs> Mine speaks. Your three poodles? Yeah. Um, I think... Well, I think Lisa brought him back to life and gave him a second chance. So I, I, I think there's... I think there's a lot to be in love with. It's sort of like this angelic being to creature. He's immediately obsessed and very thankful. Understandable, understandable. Mm -hmm. All right, so I was reading a quote Zelda gave where she emphasized that she really wanted to get like really colorful and over mm -hmm. the top with this movie. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna make you answer for each other again. Mm -hmm. Can you each give me an example of a time when the other was totally fearless with their performance, took something to an 11 and just like really blew your mind with how far they went with it? You know, I don't actually think it's in the final cut of the movie, but there is a scene where we're laying in bed, not to spoil too much, but we're laying in bed and we're drinking oh, yeah. milk. And, which is already awesome. <laughs> um, as one does, uh, some post-coital milk. Um, <laughs> But the original, the original scene of the movie was us uh, smoking weed, and the vapors are coming through the Creature. holes in my chest. Oh, that's clever. And um, you gave a very different version of the scene uh, than what ended up in. The, the scene that we have is a little bit lighter in tone, but you gave a really, really introspective and... Uh, like a longing kind of take. And I really, I really liked that take. We had to yeah. because of uh, the limitations for the smoke and all, and all that sort of stuff. It didn't end up in the final cut, but I really liked that take. So the one that's in is just terrible? I mean, you're good in every scene, but that one surprised me because I didn't read the, the scene like that initially. Yeah, wow. Um, I do love that scene. I wish it stayed in. I like the version that we had, though. Mm -hmm. That scene was uh, very difficult to get through. The scene right before it, I just couldn't stop laughing. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of days where we couldn't stop laughing. But for me, the scene that stands out with Cole's performance is the very first scene we shot with you, where mm -hmm. you come in with the axe. Oh, yeah, the big scene, yeah. I think it was just, um, you know, so much of this movie relies on Cole and his bringing of this character to life, this larger-than-life character, and he came in with this physicality, and it was so quirky and, like, lovable, and he does so many evil things in the hmm. movie, and after that day, it felt like we had a movie. I felt like, oh, we were going to make something. Uh, yeah, I think it was the first scene yeah. that I did, yeah. Such a good example of a perfect physical performance, and also the way they captured that particular shot, like, the angle just really enhances so what you were doing. Yeah, yeah Z Zelda, you know, Zelda was really smart about it, too. Um, because she, in the very beginning, I, I had talked to her about, I was working with a movement coach and I said, you know, hey, a lot of, a lot of the emotion of this character relies on his physicality being seen. And she was like, you know, from the beginning, I've always imagined most of your shots are wide shots so that we can capture a lot mm -hmm. of you. Uh, which really helped because it meant that I could be more exaggerated and I can actually have that, that sort of space to play. So she, she was very understanding of that. And yeah, it was just, it was really reassuring. Oh, I have to ask you about working with Lauren on the, the movement yeah. coach stuff. Can you tell me maybe one specific thing he taught you that wound up being a pillar to the performance and we Absolutely. could see in the finished Absolutely. cut? Absolutely. You, know, you know, when you think of like miming, you, you, you think of the invisible rope or you think of like the box, but he, um, he was a student of Marcel Marceau, and Marceau had a teaching called The Attitudes, which I really liked. And The Attitudes were an attempt to discover a kind of universal language for how we understand emotion physically. And uh, the example he used was we pretended like I was a statue for anger, as an example. Ooh. What would that statue look like? Yeah. Do you hold yourself up? What are your arms doing? What are your feet doing? And we went through tons of different emotions 
And then we would compare to Marceau's version of mm. that emotion. Because your body holds emotion. And the and most surprising places. part about, about it was how similar we instinctually go to these certain gestures. Um, and there, there actually is a kind of language in those gestures. And I, I found that just fascinating. It was so much fun. For some Who reason, I feel like I sat up a little straight. Right, exactly right. Like that. how you carry yourself outward, if it's an inward thing, where you put your arms and your legs, it was fun. Fascinated by his mm -hmm. work. I was mm -hmm. just talking to the team behind Sasquatch Sunset, and I'm like, mm -hmm. my God, like this person needs to be in the spotlight more for how he contributes to so someone's cool. performance. He's so cool. Something else. Mm -hmm. So, Catherine, for you, I have a question about Carla, because I'm always here to sing Carla Gugino's praises. Oh, she's Incredible. Best. Seriously, I think one of the best of the best, yet another person Good. in this industry that just consistently needs more credit than Absolutely. she gets. Absolutely. What is something you saw her do on this set that wowed you? Maybe even something you back pocketed and would like to try on a future film yourself? I felt like she was so um, so free, yet always knew how to keep it real. And on a set like this, with limitless opportunity and places to go in this script, she never overacted. She always kept it cool. And I think I watched her hold back. And in doing that, it created a really interesting, thought-provoking mm -hmm. performance. And, you know, she took a lot of hits there. From this guy. Uh, actually, uh, ge genuinely. She, <laughs> genuinely um, took a lot of hits. I, I was going to say, she. there's that scene where we, you know. Something bad happens to her. Something bad happens yeah. to her. And I hit her with a prop typewriter. Um, and in the first take, I hurt. totally misjudged it and smacked her in the back of the oh, head. It was, it was like a, t it was like nobody's fault, but like, yeah, it, it's She terrible. went back a little bit. I overestimated. Yeah. It was a, it was a kind of heavy foam slash plastic typewriter and I hit her and we, we continued playing through the take and when Zelda yelled cut, I mean, I was on my knees, like, <gasps> I'm so sorry, but she was such a champ about it. She laughed but about it, it was Again, great. she was a champ about it, because she's such a per she's such a real artist who's committed yeah. to the craft, and she wrote a note to me after she saw the final cut of the movie, and it just, it echoes that sentiment of like, she she brought something that we really needed. Yeah, absolutely. And she was the last person cast in the film. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. I feel like if she is the last person cast in every film, all those films are better off. I want oh, more things for Carla absolutely. always. So this is a fun question. Being heard is a powerful thing. The creature is like her therapist, her boyfriend. Oh yeah. If you two could pick a movie character to act as your therapist, oh, who would you fun. pick and why? That's fun. My instinct was Scooby-Doo. I knew you were gonna pick a, do a dog because the first one I thought about was Doug from Up. <laughs> why do I go there? It says a lot about me. I have a dog named Buddy, very Scooby-Doo like. He's a little silly. Yeah. Ooh, a movie character. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with Godzilla. Different kind of pet, but still. But just, still. I, I, because I feel like my therapist being like, yeah, just go thrash around town oh, yeah. would be so nice. Have you been? Like, to have one you of ever those? thought of destroying everything around you? I'd be like, are you cut out for this? I don't really know. I think you two ace that question. Hmm. You're him? I can't believe you're here. Uh, do you like music? I have the cure. Ooh. Oh, not that kind of cure. Ooh. They can't make you better. I mean, they can, but like emotionally. Nice complicated two-parter to start here because I love how this movie <laughs> channels like, like dark comedies and, and romantic fantasies from the 80s and early 90s, uh, Heather's, Edward Scissorhands, I could go on and on. Can you each pinpoint something from those past movies that you knew you wanted to hold tight to and include here? But then I also wanna know something that, you know, maybe those movies didn't explore enough that you wanted to go really hard into with Lisa Frankenstein. Well, I kind of love the slapstick comedy of like Beetlejuice. And I think that some of the physical comedy mm -hmm. from that movie, I think you can definitely see echoes of it in, in Zelda's direction for sure. And then um, I also love the like Lydia Dietz goth outcast type character, which I, we have actually seen in quite a few movies in the 80s. And I, you know, I, I hard relate. And then in terms of what did we do that was different? One thing I love about being alive today is we get to have these like real conversations about mental illness and grief and like be more vulnerable in our in our dialogue in a way because when i was growing up i don't think that people were talking about that stuff as much mm. so true i'll lean towards death becomes her because i really did love that kind of there was a wackiness in the friendship and also the violence in that movie 
But in terms of what I would hope, not that we did better, because I genuinely don't think that, you know, that's such a subjective thing. But I, I love that we got to explore further female friendship in this, mm -hmm. in terms of especially Taffy and Lisa and their kind of camaraderie um, in the midst of all that comic violence. I appreciated the complexity in that relationship, too. I found that to be like a lot fuller than I ever anticipated it was going to be at the beginning of the movie. And it wasn't just at odds. Like they also mm -hmm. there was a lot of love there. Exactly. That was, death becomes her. They went really at odds. And then like even sure. in the end, they're still like beating each other yeah. up. Whereas in this, there's like a lot of love underneath mm -hmm. that. So this is a little random, but this is the question I was most excited to ask you both. It puts you on the spot creatively a little yeah. bit. Let's say the creature from your movie met Emma Stone's Bella Baxter from Poor Things. Oh man. What <laughs> would they talk about and do together? Oh, I would rather that he met Christopher Abbott's character from the end of the movie and they just kind of oh. <laughs> navigated their straight. Oh, that's interesting, though. I think uh, Bella Baxter might have taken things to the next level physically sooner than Lisa did. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. fair. <laughs> I can believe that. Yeah. I mean, I also think they'd be a good dance partner for each other. Oh, I mean, yeah. Like, there's got to be a lot of physicality that would be lovely in that. That dance scene was so wonderful. I would love to see that mashup. Now that's all I'm going to be thinking about. <laughs> um, Diablo, a Jennifer's body question for you, because I was reading another interview you did where you said you thought it was funny that it was being so heavily included as a marketing tool here, which I for one loved, and it was just making me curious, what do you think it is about how audiences have evolved that are making them finally embrace that movie the way it should be? I mean, part of it is like, I, and I certainly couldn't have predicted this and didn't plan it, but there's something about like the aesthetic of that movie that really appeals to Gen Z, and I love it, and I, I it's a bit of a mystery, but it's also very exciting, of course. And I also think we're, there are things that we were doing in that movie, like the queer subtext, the dialogue about misogyny, like I think that it was um, maybe just people weren't, the mainstream audiences maybe weren't ready for it at the time, whereas now it's like conversations people are willing to have. So I'm delighted that, like I, like I said, I never, thought that that movie would be used as like an example of what this movie is like to sell it. And I'm like, that's amazing. I love it. That yeah. was one of my first press screenings ever working really? in this industry. And I vividly remember it and remember walking out loving it and then being like, why don't doesn't everybody feel like I Thank am? you. <laughs> Thank you for being an OG because there weren't many. Since day one. OK, I have a habit of getting obsessed with uh, movie lore and Bible. So, did the two of you create one for the creature? And if so, I don't know, can you give me maybe like three rules that were most important to abide by in terms of how the creature can operate? Oh, abiding by. I was going to say because we uh, the, the animated sequence in the front of the movie wasn't mm -hmm. originally in there, but I wanted to show creature's life because right. otherwise the movie never would have discussed it. So we did discuss that. Like was yeah. he a musician as it turns out and like then the girl he fell in love with and that stuff. But rules to abide by. I know for how he could function well, and evolve. Yeah. Um, we know he can drink milk. That's true. <laughs> which is, when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's interesting. He's drinking a glass of milk. He's um, not lactose intolerant. He's not lactose intolerant. <laughs> he, he can be, he can have body part, dead body parts can be reanimated, but only by Taffy's tanning mm -hmm. bed. And then I guess the third rule is um, he's, just, he's just kind of a sweetheart. I think the third rule. He doesn't ever really it is turn oat milk, so technically he could be a lactose oh, intolerant. Maybe it, well, <laughs> either way, he can he can digest beverages. Which, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I mean, like I would say he shouldn't yeah. probably go walking too much out in rainstorms either, because truthfully, if that thing can resurrect you, I'm sure it can put you back. But um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was so human from the get go. That was what I really wanted to portray. So I never really wanted to give him the rules of zombiedom. He's not contagious, he's not giving it to other mm. people. He's a resurrected man. No crying. <laughs> that was the, like, I, I mean, felt, I felt he like I should could feel smell. Oh, yeah, I could his, smell him just sitting in the theater. Smelly yeah. tears. <laughs> so, Zelda, a uh, quote that I saw you post on your Instagram that caught my eye. You said, I doubt I'll get the chance to make anything this wonderfully wacky ever again, so forgive me if I ran with it. What is something <laughs> wonderfully wacky that you wanted to do? You thought someone was going to say no, but they trusted you, believed in your vision, and now it's in the final film. Oh, the penis scene for for sure. I thought at some point someone was going to pull the rug out from underneath, like, even just the thing, because it's on the page. That was in there, but also the way I wanted to shoot it and with the slow motion and stuff, I was like, they're going to say no. 
And then they just, they kept not. So I was like, I'm just going to keep functioning as if no one's going <laughs> to say no. And thankfully now it's still in there. Yeah, still I'm glad. Fingers crossed. <laughs> we still have to release, but oh, well, it'll be in there. I, we're, I feel like now. we're good at this point. I feel like we're <laughs> safe with that. Um, so now to follow up on that, for both of you, because I want to see more movies like this, I want you to make your case right now. Why do we need more wonderfully wacky movies mm -hmm. in this world, especially ones with the uh, leads that are just so unapologetically like unique and themselves? I mean, if if it's a simple answer, but if we need them because there isn't a glut of them, you know, there's a lot of. Uh... I'm not going to pick on any particular genre, but I feel like there's a lot of the same type of movies that are coming out, probably because they're a guaranteed box office draw. And um, this one is different. I don't know if there's anything you could compare this movie to in the last year, you know? And so it's just a story that deserves to be told. It's just the, the weirdos need representation as well. We need, we need more right goth there. representation. Like, yeah. See, for me, I've always seen comedy as a really wonderful kind of, I mean, hunting ground's not the best word for it, but like a place of discovery for really great talent. And it's been a while since they've allowed as many young people to come in with it. Recently, you're seeing more of it. Like, I love what Rachel Sennett's been bringing in and some of the oh, yeah. new young girls that she's brought up with, like, bodies, bodies, bodies. And, and then with bottoms as well of, like, all this kind of comedy coming up around the same thing. But... I'd like to see even more of that. I'd like young people to have the opportunity of what we got to do here, because otherwise, how do you find someone that reminds you of Gene Wilder or Madeline Kahn? How do you bring in that new energy? Um, they have to expand. It can't just all be dead serious, or it'll all be very dead serious actors. Oh. <laughs>